purpose in gathering together unto him is that he might be glorified, that he might be exalted, worshipped, praised, lifted up. And so once again tonight we trust that even as you have been singing praises to his name, there will be a word that will help you not only to sing his praise, speak of his glory, but to become his praise. That we should, should be, Paul said, a praise unto him in the earth. We, a praise unto him, which is higher than just praising him. In our actions, our words, our deeds, and all that we do ought to be a praise unto him. And we should be to the praise of his glory, we who trust him first in Christ. I don't really come with a prepared message per se. I look into the word and have some thoughts and trust that the Lord will put them together as a living word. And so the Apostle writing to the Corinthians mentions something like this. That the wisdom that God gives us, he says, which word, uh, which things do we speak? Not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches. And, and so it's so essential that we Seek the Lord that it might be words not of man's wisdom, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, words which he gives. Paul had said that uh, there in his letter to the Corinthians, and he had come from, he come from Athens not too long before where he had all prepared a text to, as he saw the idolatry in the city, and he was invited to, uh, to come and, and speak. And he appointed a day up there in Mars Hill, because the Athenians were a, a knowledge-seeking people, always looking for more wisdom and knowledge. So here's a man that had strange things, and he said, well, we'll give you a day, and uh, you come and tell us what you're, what you're trying to explain to us. And so they appointed him a time, and Paul preached a very eloquent sermon, and he gave it the title, To the Unknown God, because he had seen that sign all over the streets of Athens, names of different gods and idols, and, and then here was, here was one uh, poster, or whatever you call it, to the unknown God, in case they missed somebody, some god, they put up another little idol or whatever, to the unknown God. So Paul took that as his theme and he explained to them that the God who is unknown to them, he knows them. He was very eloquent and he, and uh, I, I don't doubt God gave him those words and all that. But there didn't seem to be much uh, effect on the people from it. And some said, well, we'll, we'll hear you again about this, Paul. Thanks for coming and all. Maybe have another time like this. I think there's something there that discouraged him a little. So he says, when I came to you, Corinthians, I came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. But I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And 
He emphasized that. that. That's all that counts. That's all that matters. Jesus Christ and him crucified is the wisdom of God. Which he says, I know it's foolishness with man, but unto us which are saved, it is Christ, the power of God, the cross. Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. So there's a wisdom, there's a hidden wisdom, which none of the rulers of this world both have known. For had they known it, would they, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. I think he was not only referring to earthly rulers, but rulers in the spiritual realm. Had they known the power of the cross and what would come as a result of the cross, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as he was crucified there in the cross, these powers in the heavenly places began to be shaken. They were shaken and they were losing their power at the cross. Don't, don't forget that. Not at his resurrection, at the cross. He destroyed principalities and powers and made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in his cross. Certainly he was triumphant in his resurrection, but the victory was accomplished at the cross. And so we glory in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. God forbid we should glory in anything else. Same in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, Paul said, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Two things happen there. We emphasize that one thing that he was crucified for me. But Paul says at the cross, I was crucified by that cross. I was crucified. The world was crucified unto me. And I was crucified as far as the world was concerned. And the world unto me. It was God's judgment of sin and God's judgment of this whole world system took place at the cross. And he arose triumphant, victorious, but before he died, he had such confidence and assurance that he had done the will of God and that he was going to the cross and the will of God he was able to say before he hung there on the cross, I have overcome the world. Not to be afraid, I have overcome the world. So we thank the Lord, he is overcomer. I, I know I mentioned this a lot. That he who is king of all kings and lord of all lords is seen as the triumphant one in the heavens as a lamb that was slain. He overcome by the cross as a lamb that was slain. We, we can't understand that. We, we think of that as a place where God manifested his love, certainly. It is a outflow of the love of God that sent him to the cross, we know that. But do we always realize that at the cross he triumphed? He was victorious. He displayed openly in the heavens the defeat of principalities and powers in heavenly places. But God forbid that we should try to use eloquency or wisdom of man to try to portray uh, the wisdom of God in, in any words that we have, any words that we have mastered, can't help but, you know, sort of delight in hearing eloquent words, uh, but it doesn't really touch the heart as that word will when there are words which the Holy Spirit speaks. Not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. I think the word comparing doesn't just mean a, here's a Bible, here's another book. I compare the two, but it has more than the thought I'm told of a, a combination of one with the other, combining spiritual with spiritual. 
And so God, the great spirit, who inhabits eternity, has condescended to put his spirit in us, that there might be in us something that relates to what's in the heart of God. Otherwise, we know nothing about God with the natural mind. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness unto him. But we've got natural minds, but he's put his Spirit within us, where we have a spiritual mind. And so God is able to relate to us as he takes the things of heaven and joins it to the portion of the Spirit that's in us. So that we use the expression oftentimes deep, call upon the deep. Over those great depths that there are in God that crying out to that depth that he's put in there, sometimes it's very shallow. And so what God does is he, he takes a person through hard times, difficulties, tribulations, testings, to bring about that heart that will cry out for him. I used to wonder about that expression, deep calleth unto deep. At the noise of thy waterfalls, David said, deep calleth unto deep. And then I, I looked it up and read further, all thy billows have gone over me. And then I realized that David went through deep waters and the billows went over him. And insomuch that many times he thought, it's all over. But God was preparing him by those billows for that deep calling unto deep. To put in David something that would cry out unto God. God wants us able to cry out unto him. He likes to hear that cry because there's something in the heart of God that cries out for, for you. We often think, well, I'm nothing. Why, why would God want me? And we sometimes even demean ourselves, you know, I'm, I'm nobody. And that's, that's true enough. I'm not denying that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a nobody. But God chooses the things that are nobody. The, the, the base of this world, the, the things that are despised and rejected. And, and then Paul went a step further. Yea, the things that are nothing. He chooses to bring to nothing the things that are. God's going to bring to naught. You know, this whole world system is going to use people that are nothing. Bring to nothing the things that are. Talk about the wisdom of God. So he says, Don't glory in man, don't glory in yourself. I mean, it's all coming down. God's going to bring down the glory of men, the pride of man. He's bringing it all down. That's what the day of the Lord's all about. So he'll bring to naught the wisdom of man. Stain. The prophet says, stain the pride of all glory. And so we don't anticipate all the suffering and the chaos that's going to come in the earth. But when it happens, God's got a hiding place for his people. And there's, it's, not up, it's not by God taking us up in the clouds. I know that happens. But I, I wish people who would quote that would read when it happens. That's the last trumpet, not the first one, nor the second or the third. But the last trumpet, when victory has been accomplished by the Lamb ruling on the throne, destroying all his enemies, and the last trumpet takes place, not the first one. It's so clear, and yet you don't quote that, well, don't you know we're going to be taken up here the Lord of the last trumpet? Yeah. The last one. There's many trumpets to be sounded. And there's a feast called the Feast of Trumpets. Which is a special time when the trumpets would be blown to call the people of God to come together to keep the Feast of the Lord and the Day of Atonement and the Feast of Tabernacles. And there's a feast called the Feast of Trumpets. God is blowing the trumpets, and I believe he's going to cause a clear sound to go forth. I believe you'll be faithful before the end to send forth a clear word. Not denying there's 
there's some clarity coming forth, but there's so much mixture that people don't know what to believe. God's going to send forth a clear word. God raises up a clear voice in times of apostasy. People say, don't you know the church is going to be apostate in the last day? Yes. That's why in the last days God's going to have a clear word. He always raises up a clear word in the time of apostasy. That's why he raises up prophets. Because the hearts of men have become alienated from him and God prepares someone, a voice, to stand up in that hour with a clear word. Israel was apostate, very apostate. The religious system was apostate. In the days of Eli the priest, he made his sons priests. Well, they inherited it. But their hearts were not priestly. They were covetous, full of wickedness. Eli, I think he tried to remedy the situation, but he couldn't do it. Just hopeless. And he reproved his sons a little, but it fell on deaf ears. And God was working all the time this was going on. He was preparing something. He prepared it before he manifested it, many years before, when he chose his handmaiden, Hannah. He loved Hannah, but he kept her barren, which was a shame in Israel not to have children. He kept her barren because he loved her. God wanted to be glorified. And so he kept her barren, and in her barrenness she would cry to the Lord, God, why have you kept me this way? What, Lord, uh, my adversary there, she, she's always making remarks about my barrenness, and, and she's got many children, and, and I don't have a son, and I want a son, and she went on like that for how many years, I don't know. One time when they were up there keeping the feast and she sat there on a bench there by the tabernacle, her head sad, her face sad, and her lips moving a little bit, and Eli was watching her lips moving but not making any sounds. And he says, lady, put away the wine, this is no place to be drunken. She says, no, my Lord, I'm a woman of a, a grieved and heavy spirit. And then he realized his mistake, and he says, go and grant you your request. Now, that was a very eloquent prayer. That was an eloquent prayer. Because she followed that by saying, Lord, you give thy handmaiden a son, and I'll give him back to you the days of his life he shall be yours and I believe God's waiting for that kind of a commitment oh Lord we need you we need your presence we need your power we need your mighty gifts in our midst functioning in the power of the spirit of God but so far there's been too much glory in that what God gave me you know God gave me this gift she never got the answer to her prayer until she said the Lord, you give me a son, and I'll give him back to you. He'll be yours. And I believe that God is pleased. And we said, Lord, we must have whatever it is we need. But Lord, if you, if you grant it, Lord, it'll be yours. It won't be mine. Because if we are slaves purchased by the Lord, redeemed and bought, and are his possession, we don't, no matter what, we have in our hands, it's not ours. If we belong to him, certainly everything we have belongs to him. Not your 10%. No. Oh, that 10% God? No. 20%? No. 30 90 No. 100%. It's all God there. You're not a true servant. It's all his. But then if you're a steward of what God's given you. And you must know the Lord's will in all that you do with whatever God gives you. Knowing it's all His. 
Hannah kept her promise when the son was born. She took him up there to the temple to dedicate him and, and left him there finally when he was weaned, left him there and go up annually to see her little son once a year, take him as we cold. That'd be pretty hard, wouldn't it? He made a vow, I'll do it, Lord. I must have the son. Now God's not overshadowing all that because God was going to do something special with that special son. There he was, growing up there in the religious era of his time, <coughs> which had become very corrupt. There he was, growing right up under Eli. And Eli's heart and ears had become dull of hearing. And God spoke to little Samuel. Samuel. So he runs to Eli. He knew no other voice but that. And he'd hear that voice often. Little lad there in the temple helping the priest. Samuel. You know the story. He went. No, no, Eli said, I, I wasn't talking to you. Go back, go back. He went back. Here's the voice again, Samuel, Samuel. Oh, he is calling me. He, went. he said, you did call me. No, this time, I know you called me. No, no, my son. Three times. And by that time, he realized, God must be talking to me. And he didn't know it because he didn't know God. <coughs> So Eli said, now the next time you hear that voice, say, sweet Lord, for thy servant heareth. In plain English, sweet Lord, for thy servant is listening. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. But are you listening? Let us learn to listen, let us learn to hear. God has a way of bringing us to that. We talked about it a little this morning. We were committed to him. And God pierces our ear like the servant who had become a slave in Israel and released in the seventh year. If he wanted to stay a servant of this man whom he loved, then he'd take him to the doorpost of the house and pluck his ear through with an awl, signifying my ears pierced to hear only the voice of my master all the rest of the days of my life. David said, Mine ear has thou opened, and a marginal reference is, Mine ear thou hast pierced. I think it's referring to that piercing. And so it was that our Lord Jesus came into the earth with his ear pierced, pierced. And by the Lord, here would be one who would hear the Father's voice, but he'd be tempted in that area. We think of the Lord Jesus as one who could not be tempted, but he became a man that he could be tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. And you know the story of the temptation that he went through. His ear was pierced. Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. No other voice will I hear but your voice. And that's the commitment that he carried with him all, all through his days of ministry and here. Learning obedience. Here in this planet, learning obedience. Not because he was disobedient, but because he had come into a realm where obedience was required. He was Lord of all in heaven. He wouldn't learn obedience there. He was Lord, but he came to the realm of a bond slave. Took upon the form of, of a bond slave that he might learn obedience. God most high humbly himself to become a bond slave. For the redemption of mankind. And so uh, Samuel went back to bed, and again the voice Samuel, Samuel. Speak, Lord, I'm listening. And God began to talk to him. What he was going to do, he was going to do a great work in Israel. He was going to deal with the priesthood. And God says, the things that I will do, 
the ears of both of those that hear it will tingle with the things that I'm going to deal with so drastically. I'm going to deal with this priesthood. Let me tell you, if God was concerned about an earthly priesthood, an earthly priesthood back there, which is only in type and shadow, and God was concerned about it. Don't you think God's concerned about this holy priesthood in the earth? This came about because of his redemption and making us all to be kings and priests unto God. God's far more concerned in this priesthood than he was in that. And he's going to raise up that voice, that the sentinel has, clear voice from God. You say, you know, well, the prophet, yeah, he's a prophet. I think he missed it, you know, here and there. And so and so, well, yeah, I think he's a real prophet. But you know, all prophets will make mistakes. We know that. They'll make mistakes. But the word that God put in Samuel in the Old Testament is so clear. Not one word fell to the ground. Not one word, not one percent. He spoke a clear word from God. It didn't mean he knew everything. But he waited on God. He went up to anoint one of the sons of Jesse as a king and he thought the first one come up, well, must, this must be the one. God said, no. He heard the word of God. It wasn't going to be presumptuous. Declare the first one was the second one to be the new king of Israel. He waited for God. You know all that story, too. So there were all the sons that had gone by. And they had told the younger son out of the field, tending the sheep. God said, this is the one. For by nature we would choose that which looks pleasing, that which looks strong, that which looks wise, powerful. But God doesn't choose as man chooses. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, saith the Lord, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so are my ways above your ways and my thoughts above your thoughts. That's Quite a distance, isn't it? The difference between what the way you and I think of things and the way God looks at it—a big difference. How, how much difference? Heavens are above the earth. That's the difference. And when we see God's ways and understand a little about it, we, we come to understand that. Oh God, you don't think the way we do. We, we don't think. The way And so our minds are renewed. And I know God's going to do a great work in his people. And he's going to renew the minds of his people. And the new covenant, I think I mentioned like today, is not just Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, actually, in the first century, the crazy season, and so forth. The new covenant is this, says the Lord. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. Not like that one. Why? Wasn't it a good covenant? Yeah. Why isn't he going to make another one like it? Because it didn't continue in it. Well, then they might not continue in the new covenant. It's different than the new covenant. It's different. The new covenant is a right on the heart, changing the heart. The old covenant was something they could read and try and obey. God said, this is the covenant I will make with them after those days. I will write my laws in their hearts and in their minds I will write them. Wouldn't that be, won't it be wonderful when God literally writes his desires in our minds? Indelibly writes it in our minds and in our hearts. The fulfillment of the new covenant is, is, I believe, close at hand. It's, it's not totally fulfilled yet until God does that. That is the new covenant. It's not fulfilled just because the canon of Scripture is complete. We thank the Lord for the Scriptures. And the Scriptures there give us hope that God will not let one word, word fall to the ground. When God speaks, not one word will fall to the ground uh, as void of no value, of no power. So 
How important to hear the voice of the Lord. We want to hear from you, Lord. And I don't care whether it's in some humble soul that's sitting there in the congregation and I have a word from God and they stand. This is what God says. Or some great prophet makes no difference. Because there's no great prophet except if the greatness of God is upon them. There's no great people unless God is great within them. Paul the Apostle, we say, the great Apostle Paul. Paul says, I'm nothing and Apollos is nothing. I planted Apollos water. God gave him the increase. So then neither is he that planted anything, nor he that water. They're just doing what God enabled them to do. What's important is God has given them the increase. Plant a seed, well, that's the job God gave you to do. Someone comes along and waters it, well, that's part of God's plan. But neither one of the, those people are important except that if they walk in obedience, nothing matters except that God did it and God gave it the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything nor he that waters, but God that giveth the increase. So we're judged for our faithfulness just to do what God wants us to do. Not for doing as much as we can. Do as much as we can, you know, I've got a short life to live and I want to crown in all the good works I can. And you can miss God, you can miss his, miss his purposes in that. We're here to do his will in the earth. And on Judgment Day, and this is the most awesome thing, he's going to judge us all according to our works. Judgment day when we stand before him, that day of Christ. The apostle encourages us to walk with God that we'll be able to rejoice right here in the face of judgment. We stand before the Lord in judgment. And our works are presented to him. And does he have a pair of balances there that sets it on there to see how heavy it is? No. So is it all in the fire. Your works and mine throws it in the fire. Consuming everything with wood, hay, and stubble. Leaving the gold, the silver, the precious stone. I remember hearing this story, and I don't know who the man was, and I'm glad. So I don't have to name anybody. The time came, God says, I'm taking you. All that you've done in life has been wood, hay, and stubble. A famous preacher. Oh, God, help us to be ready for the fire. God put gold, silver within us, precious stones, because the fire is coming upon God's church. The trials are coming. And those before the day of the Lord, before the day when we stand before Him, there's going to be a trial by fire when God will try His people all over the earth. Time of great trial for all those who dwell upon the face of the earth. So we thank the Lord that now is the time to store up against the day of His judgment. Store up what love and mercy and truth. Because love and mercy and truth in his people is something that will survive judgment. In fact, James is that boast us in the face of judgment. Because he's been merciful, loving, generous, walking before God in truth. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So God raised up a prophet in the midst of Israel's great apostasy when God was so weird with all he said, I'm going to destroy that priesthood of the Eli. I'm going to raise up a new kind of priesthood. And Samuel declared it. Eli had to 
urgent to tell him what this vision was because he was just a boy. He was afraid God was saying something that Daniel didn't want to tell him, but he told him. Eli said, the Lord has said it. Let him do it for some such way. He was grieved, no doubt. Somehow it seems that we have that kind of a ministry in the earth, so much of it. I think they love God, but they don't, their hearts aren't totally sold out to Him. Their ears have become dull of hearing, and they sort of give up. I can't do anything with this people. Many pastors are retiring and taking up secular employment, which is good. I think that's great. I do. Listing younger people to come in and become ministers, and some of the older ones are taking sabbaticals, take a year off. They can't handle it. They can't, just can't handle it because the people they hired they hired you to do the job. Now we want you to give it to us. We want you to give us good sermons and good teachings and marry our young people and marry our dead and visit the sick and. Is it the hospital? We hired you for that. That's not God's way. God's way is that every member in the body of Christ will have a vital part to play. Vital in God's sight, maybe not in yours or in his, or in the eyes of men. Everyone has a part, and I think every one of us should earnestly seek the Lord. Lord, I just want to know what you want me to do. Not that doesn't be great or wonderful in the eyes of men, but just be assured God wants you to do it. And it will be to the praise of his glory. For I do believe the time is at hand where, as Paul said, writing to the Corinthians, God giveth more abundant honor to those parts which lack, that there be no schism in the body, but that the members might have the same care one for another. I believe that the times of hand when God's going to begin to do that. Giving more honor to the one that doesn't think he has much. Doesn't have enough. Feels incompetent. Part which lack. The more abundant honor on. What does that mean? I don't know. But the honor of God, we don't have to know what it might mean. It'll be an honor from God on the nobodies in the church who love God and they feel inadequate and insufficient. And I don't have anything to impart. Expect the Lord to put his honor there. Whatever is implied by that, it will mean this, that people of God will be coming to you and saying, listen now, I sense that God's with you. He answers your prayers and you give words of wisdom, knowledge, or you pray for people and they get healed. You know, whatever it might be. And guard against the thought, oh, I got some great gift from God now. I'm going to go out in the ministry. God wants that right there in the local assembly. I don't think any young man or woman needs to worry about getting out in the ministry. If you're walking with God, He'll send you out wherever He wants you to go. If you hear His voice, you don't need it. Oh, I got to travel, I got to go here, got to go there to do something for God. Yes. Do God's work right today where you are. Do His will. All He requires of any man. Just do His will. Day by day. Insignificant as it might seem in your eyes or in the eyes of your fellow man, God is going to see that true heart and He's going to begin to put some measure of honor upon them that they'll be recognized by the rest of the body as being very such, very like. Why, are there so, why is there so much schism in the body of Christ for lack of that? When he puts more abundant honor on the parts which are lacking, it's because he wants a people where there'll be no schism in the body. If there'll be no schism in the body, because then the members will have the same care one for another. Every individual will have care <coughs> for his fellow member in the body. And 
powerful care. You have an administration of care. So it's going to be very beautiful when we see that beginning to take place. Wouldn't be surprised it's happening here. Certain measure at least. God's putting on a different one. Oh, I wonder if God's going to send me for some ministry. Forget it. I mean, that's not the important thing. The important thing is do God's will wherever you are. And sending forth a ministry, that's the, that's the option of the Holy Spirit. Paul and Barnabas and names a few other prophets and teachers who in the church at Antioch seeking God, praying, fasting, seeking the Lord. And who was it? Barnabas went down and found Saul, brought him up to, up to uh, Antioch to be with them, hunted him out. He knew that God's hand was on him. And Saul had gone to work with his hands, and, but he had that mighty apostolic call. You're wasting your time, Paul. No. He realized he had to go back to his trade. And uh, God found him at the right time. He sent Barnabas down and encouraged him to come back with him to, to Antioch, seeking the Lord together, praying, fasting, loving the Lord, you know, like you folks here. Suddenly the Holy Spirit said, Set apart Saul and Barnabas for the work we're into us called. You know? No, no mission board on and put in your application if you want to go to the Philippines and look, look it over and separate me, Saul and Barnabas, for the work we're into us called. And then they didn't run the next day. They waited on the Lord some more, fasted some more. And the right time sent them forth from the church. So we got churches that send forth missionaries, and I'm not criticizing them. They seek the Lord, but it's so far from apostolic uh, methods in most cases. You've got to qualify. You've got to be a certain age. Oh, no, you're too old. Fifty years you're up, but older is too old. Recently, I was told of a situation down in Toronto where a man wanted to uh, get into the ministry, not missionary work, just get into the ministry. Oh, yeah, 51. Well, I'm sorry. Fifty-one, we uh, we don't take anyone in, into the ministry at fifty-one. God called Moses when he was eighty. He <laughs> 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 said to me back there. Aren't, aren't you going to miss me? I said, maybe someday. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do? Wish you were 80? I said, I don't know. But Moses waited until he was 80. <laughs> and um, it's not funny, but um, I think God has grieved many times that the, uh, oh, the folly in our own hearts to think that we can organize. Uh, crusade amongst Christians to reach the world for Christ. God has a plan. He tells us what his plan is. That when he has the people in union with Jesus, as Jesus is in union with the Father, the world will know that Jesus is the Son of God. And that's why he puts his glory on his people. I and them and thou and me that the world might know that the Father has sent me. Oh, but you say, we can't make that happen. Right. And so you'll do something that can happen. And it's not reaching the world for Christ. That was the age of some of these young fellows here. And sat in the church, a powerful church there in Vancouver in those days. Evangelistic Tabernacle. And China had just fallen to the communists. I forget, the very early 40s, I think. And there was sort of a, a lamentation amongst the ministry, and China's lost now. 
time is lost. And then, process of time, we better concentrate on India. The doors are still open in India. China can't, the doors are closing. God closes the door. Don't you know Jesus has the keys to open the doors and to close them? He's got the keys to open doors and close them. I think God closed the doors to ecclesiasticism in China that he might do a pure work in there. Great things are going on in China. After the missionary program stopped, after not during it, after the program stopped, God began to do a work amongst the people which still goes on. And then when the doors open at that old excitement, we can go and minister in China again. They should be coming over here, ministering to people here in Canada, the United States. There was one minister, I didn't hear this, but someone told me he was a Chinese minister who ministered over at that religious broadcast station called CBN or the religious program is what they feature and they were interviewing this minister from China and he says now do you, he talked about the work in China now have you got a word for the church in America he says yeah but God says the church in America is dead but he says I will yet have a powerful church in America and after the program, the, uh, get the uh, one sponsoring the program says, well, we're certainly not dead here, are we? Oh, no, no, praise God, we got life. You don't want to believe, you know, ask for a word, doesn't work for America yet. Yeah. No one will believe it. Jesus said to one of the churches, you have a reputation, you know, of being somebody, I don't know the exact word. You think you're alive, but you're dead. Strengthen those things which are almost dead, lest I come and deal with you. I forget what the phraseology is there. God looks upon the church of Laodicea, the seventh church in the book of Revelation. Surely it must be this day and age, if, that's the, if this is the last day, and that's the seventh church. And he looks upon them and he says, Thou sayest thou art rich, increased with goods, that need of nothing. But I say, this is the way I see it, thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and hold it or and naked. Says, that's the way I see it. But he doesn't condemn them for that. He says, as many as I love are rebuked and chastened. Not condemning them. He's trying to cause them to see and hear what he would say to the churches. And so he gives them good counsel. I counsel thee to buy of me gold. Tried in the fire that you might be rich. I start to anoint your eyes that you might see. White raiment that you might clothe yourself with his righteousness that your shame does not appear. He has every provision for Laodicea and he loves Laodicea. He's got every provision for it. He's not rejected the, rejecting them. He says, I want you to buy the true riches. Oh, tried in the fire. I shall to anoint your eyes. White raiment to clothe yourself. God's got that, sir. Who? You to see him. <coughs> He's got the greatest promises for later to see him. Well, any of them are just as great a promise for later to see him than any other church. But as long as we say, I see, we can't, we won't bother with the eye stuff. As long as we say, oh, we're rich, we're doing good, we're raising 50 
what are we here? For fifty million, fifty thousand a year, whatever. We're sending out missionaries. We've got pastors. We support. You know, they were rich because of all that. As long as they say we're rich, we're not going to partake of the true riches. We need to declare bankruptcy and then, oh, Christ has got everything when we declare bankruptcy. As long as we can get by, we're doing fine. We're doing, we're doing pretty good. Our congregation is growing. People are coming in. Oh, I'm not criticizing the whole thing. But that's sort of the perspective that I see it from. But Christ is grieved. He must be grieved because he stands there at the door and knocks. Crying out to those on the inside. Oh, you're saying the song is, Come, come, Lord Jesus. And he's out there knocking. Please open the door. Oh, come on in. No, you open the door. Any man will hear my voice and open the door. I will come in unto him and will sup with him. I'll have dinner with him and he with me. I want to eat with you. Oh, you say, but the world's in need of preachers and missionaries. If God's people could only realize that the needs of the world are only going to be met, only going to be met when God has a people who will sit down at the table with Jesus and eat with him and he eats with them. You see, that's not doing anything to be so well. It's because we haven't had that kind of experience. Let me tell you, when we have that kind of experience, with Jesus at our table, eating at our table. It's going to do something that will transform us. I know that. Because I know a couple of men that had that experience. They were walking along the road after the resurrection and Christ had been raised from the dead. And they heard rumors of it, but it seems so unthinkable that Seemed like fairy tales to many of them. And a stranger joined them as they walked along the road. And he said, I heard you discussing some things. And what was it you were talking about? Oh, they said, are, are you a foreigner here? A visitor? Just, haven't you heard what's going on? He said, what? Oh, he says about this man, Jesus, that we thought he was going to be the Messiah, the set of his kingdom, everything is going to be great. Uh, here in Israel, and, and, and they slew him, crucified him. We heard rumors, they rose from the dead, but we haven't seen him, and, and they were sad and downcast. And then he said, Oh, you fools, and it's full of heart. Can't you believe what the prophets have written? <coughs> Beginning of way back in Genesis and all through the prophecies, he, he expounded to these. The two men, the truth concerning the Messiah. I must suffer, he must die, he must rise again from the dead. And, oh, their hearts burned within them as they heard those words, but they never saw him. Their eyes were sort of blinded. They never really saw him. And then they were on their way to Emmaus, and they came to the road that turned off to Emmaus. And and the stranger took a different road, started to walk a different road. Oh, they said, please, please come back and come with us. It's getting dark now. Come and stay with us. Oh, he was waiting for that. He was waiting for that invitation. He wanted to have supper with him. Well, he was raised from the dead. He didn't seem to eat anymore. Well, no. He didn't need to eat this natural food. But he was still the Christ that walked with them in the days of his mortality. He's still the same Christ who ate with them at the Last Supper. Only now, the food was different, I know. He didn't need the natural food, but 
We want to fellowship with them. And in that fellowship, we're partaking of glory and of benefit. You mean Christ, the Most High? Yes, it's a joy to the heart of God when you have people who take time to sit with Him and talk to Him and eat with Him. As you unburden your heart to Him, and He declares His heart to you. Not that I know a great deal about that, but I know there's something precious there, something powerful. Come with us. He was waiting for that. But why didn't he just walk with us? I don't know. He waits many times for the invitation. He tried to go another way. Oh, no, no, come back. Come with us. He looked for that. He was waiting for us. So he stands at the door of the city. He could have, yeah, he could have banged the door open and gone in. He wanted the invitation. Say, that hit my voice. And when I open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him. He with me. So they sat at the table in the home of one of those disciples whose name was what? Was it Cleopas? The other disciples not named? He sat at the table as they conversed one with the other. And they were fascinated and touched with his words that he spoke along the way. And now he's at their table, continuing speaking to them the things concerning the kingdom of heaven. And then they gave him bread, and he took the bread and broke it. And their eyes were open, and they saw him, and he broke the bread. Him. And he vanished out of their sight. Oh, they were so excited. Must have been about midnight. They got up and walked all the way back to Jerusalem. Twenty six miles, I think, they walked. That night, all the disciples had seen the Lord. And you know, you know the rest of the story. Saw the Lord at the breaking of the bread. Paul says, no, Jesus is the bread of life, I know. He's the light of the world, I know. But now in his absence, you and I are to be that light and that bread. But Jesus said before he went away, ye are the light of the world. And Paul says, you are to shine as light in the midst of the crooked and perverse generation. Why he left us here to shine as light. In the midst of the darkness, we can't shine with any light we have. We have no light except the light that comes to us when we look upon his face. That's how we partake of light. When we look into his face. And he shines upon us. God is going to reveal himself. I truly believe to a people in this last hour, face to face, His glory will once again shine in the house of God. And now He's preparing the people like the disciples who were disappointed and discouraged and feeling their hopes were lost, yet loving Him. He's preparing them. For that revelation, I do believe. For we are to be not only the body of Christ, but the bread of Christ. Know ye not, says Paul, that ye are one bread, one body. The body of Christ, bread, bread for the hungry? Yes. And so here they are up on the hillside. 5,000 men about had followed him, had gone three days without eating. It was such a hunger for the Word of God. Following Jesus, there's a great multitude there, and Jesus said to Philip with us, What are we going to do about this? How are we going to 
feed this vast multitude? God raises those questions in our midst. And so we got our cal- get our calculators out and say, now this is what we need. You know, there's 5,000 people here. We need, oh, 3,000 loaves of bread, 2,000, you know. And all the time, the Lord wants to reveal himself as the bread of life. So what have you got? Oh, well, we've discovered there's one lad here got five small loaves and two fishes, but what is that, you know, among so many? Jesus says, bring it to me. No, that's the secret. doesn't matter how much you got or how little. That's the secret. Put it in his hand. Bring it to me. So they brought him the five loaves and the two fishes, which seemed to me to be a, a picture of the ministry. Five loaves. Five-fold ministry. Five pillars in front of the sanctuary and the tabernacle. The entranceway to the sanctuary. Five pillars of which hang a curtain. And I believe we're in that realm of the holy place. But that's not the ultimate. There's another realm called the holiest of all. We're not going to that. But it's midway. We're midway along the way. We've been to the brazen altar. We trust in the labor where we know of redemption, forgiveness of sin, cleansing. And God has brought us into the holy place of ministry and service unto the Lord. And then you're satisfied with that. It seems that many times when God moves by His Spirit and does a new thing in His people, it's great and wonderful so much so that the people have finally at last, finally we, we've got what we live for. Instead of realizing, no, that, that's just a part. It's still just a part. Oh, but it's such wonderful gift then. Paul says, we just know in part, we prophesy in part. It's all partial. It's not complete. There is a completion to come. What, in greater gifts? No. In love. Oh, okay, we've heard of that all our lives. Yeah, yeah, we need more love. And we think we know what love is because we've talked about it. The church has yet to learn what true love is. Love is powerful. It's not just a sentimental thing. Oh, no, yeah, I love you, my brother. Let's be good friends with no, Meeting together, 2,000 people, you know. Shake a hand, let's shake hands with the brother behind you and tell him you love me, you know. Oh, the grief stirred. Yeah, we love you, brother. I'm not being fun of that. I'm just saying love is deep and powerful. It's full of kindness and mercy and patience and long suffering. Full of truth. Full of faith. Beyond faith. Full of faith, but it's beyond that. Patient, enduring, never faileth. Gifts fail. Apostle points that out. Because they're only in part, it's not the full answer. It's a great provision, but the provision that God gave in gifts is that it might be administration in the body of Christ to bring them to maturity where every one of them becomes a vital member of the body that in the purposes of God and the fires come, this loaf of bread is warm. God has in preparation for the feeding of the nations of the earth that are starving. Yeah, one bread, one body. So we like the fat thought of one body, everybody's joined in unity. And that is good. But uh, there's a purpose in God doing that. He wants to make bread. He wants to make bread for the world, for the starving. Out of you and I, yes. So there was in the Old Testament, one of the offerings was a meal offering. So they take this pure grain, <coughs> pour it in some kind of a mortar, or some kind of a grinding machine, and pulverize it so it's a 
and smiling. And all those little grains lose their identity. And you look in there and I just see flour. I don't see this grain or that one or the other. I see flour. But that's only part of the process. Then it must be mingled with oil, olive oil. So that mixture of flour or bread with the oil, you got dough. But that, that's not complete yet. Every time God does something new, something great, the spirit, this is the end now, this is it. We're ready now. No. Dough. And who wants to eat dough? He puts it in the oven. So it becomes bread. And there's another being prepared. To the body of Christ, yes, it will destroy the wicked, we're told. But in that same hour when God is dealing with the iniquity in the, in the world, he's preparing the people for his glory. And this people who have submitted to the dealings of God, to the questions of God, to the blending of the anointing of God in their lives, baked in the oven, Come forth as bread, still not finished. So that bread is taken in his hands and he breaks it. And in the breaking of the bread, Christ is revealed. Broke the bread. They saw him. There is a revelation of Christ yet to come where we see him. I don't try and figure out what that means. Not to see him with these eyes, but to see him in the spirit. Something that's beyond hearing the word. Both are essential. So John writes his epistle. Those things which we have seen, heard, that our eyes have looked upon, hands have handled of the word of life. Those things which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. He might have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father. The fellowship that we have one with another in the body of Christ proceeds from the fellowship that individually we have with the Father. As you have fellowship with the Father, fellowship with one another, you're sharing your relationship with the Father with one another. God is going to do that in the breaking of the bread. Well, you've lost your identity. No longer that grain here, that grain there, that grain. Flour mingled with oil, cooked in the oven, coming out as bread, broken in the hands of Jesus. What happens to men? Every need of the 5,000 people. Philip had suggested a thing to Philip. 200 penny worth, pretty great, 200 pounds worth. Every man would have a taste, at least. The gimmicks we have to, you know, to raise money to meet the needs of the earth. It's not doing it, hasn't done it. When I sat there in the Vancouver the Tabernacle in Vancouver in the early 40s, lamenting the fact that China had been lost, there was about at that time, I think there was about two billion people in the earth. And the program was send more missionaries. There's two billion people there, many of them don't know God. Now there's six. They're using the same methods. There's six billion, three times as many as what I was your age. You sell them the same thing, get out there and evangelize them. God says, wait before me. Open the door. I want to come in and sup with you. You with me. And I'll take that bread. Break it. And you see me. There's a breaking coming amongst the people of God which we are not to fear. God wants to break bread with us. And once again, when he does it, he does it by the 
spirits. I know we have communion that's become almost almost meaningless. Sorry to say that, but it's become almost meaningless. The taking of the communion with the Holy Spirit being Lord in our midst is the ministration of life. As we partake of those emblems, even, the ministration of life, if we are truly one body, is the ministration of life. Because it speaks of Christ's body being broken and his blood being shed that we partake of when we're in fellowship with him and abiding with him and eating with him and he with us. To eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you know, will make him know. Oh, it's not some priest transforming it into the body of Jesus. It's God taking the truth that happened at Calvary and building it into our hearts and lives so we know that we eat his flesh by walking with him in obedience and eating every word that proceeds out of his mouth and believing it. God, we thank you that you're not finished yet with your church, Lord, but you're working on it. And even now, later to see you, stand, stand at the door saying, please let me in. I want to come in. I want to sup with you. I want to sit down at your table and eat with you. We're inclined to say we're too busy, Lord. We've got too many programs that we've got to attend to to reach the world. And you're, you're saying, I want to sit with you. Sup with you and you with me. Help us, Lord Jesus to take time just to sit at your feet and hear your word. And then do what you say, walk in obedience. We thank you, Lord, for these people who've come out diligently seeking your face. And Lord, we just pray that great grace will rest upon them. Lord, that you will fulfill every desire of goodness within them, Lord, I sense they come with hungry hearts, Lord, desiring you above all else. Maintain that hunger, Lord. Feed them with thy eternal living word. May even these words, Lord, spoken this day. And may they find a place in the hearts of your people, Lord. May it not become void. May it be a word from your heart that you will assure us and them that it will not return to your void, but may bring forth truth in their lives for your honor and glory, that you might be magnified, your name glorified, your people edified in the things of the Lord, and become that living bread for the nations which are starving. Help us just to be, Lord, a people who are ready to declare bankruptcy, because you have done all the riches of wisdom and knowledge and understanding for your people if we declare that we're poor in spirit and in need of you. Oh Lord, we thank you for, you, for your great salvation. Thank you for your fellowship with your people, for your patience with us. Thank you for sending us here, Lord, to fellowship with these people and share a word and receive blessing from them, even from the fact that they were eating together, sharing a blessing with them as we have sat before you together in this place. God, Lord, your blessing as we sit there.